I'm Anu Drivers from Definity, and in this talk, I'll present how we use consensus to build the internet computer. So first, let's look at the internet computer. The internet computer will be powered by machines in data centers across the world, and they communicate via the internet and the internet computer protocol. And by collaborating this way, they form this virtual internet computer. And the internet computer will allow users to write pieces of software that we call canisters. And these canisters can run on top of the internet computer in a very secure and reliable way. Secure meaning that the state of my canister will only change according to the rules of my canister and, not, and cannot be tampered with. And very reliable, meaning that my canister will not suddenly stop running. We want to achieve these properties while we know that some machines across the world might have connection issues or might even be malicious. Additionally, we want the internet computer to scale, meaning we can run more and more canisters on the internet computer. It can grow its capacity. Well, to achieve these goals, we have what we call subnets. So we split the canisters into smaller groups, and each group will run on a subnet. And now we can make sure that we can always add subnets to the internet computer, thereby growing its capacity. And if we now zoom into a single subnet, this is where we want to get the security and reliability. We do that by a process called replication. Instead of having a single machine power a subnet, if we look under the hood, we see that many machines across the world will power a subnet. Each of them will have the state of all the canisters that run on the subnet, and each of them will process all the changes that come in. And now, if maybe one of the machines powering the subnet is unavailable or is even malicious, this will not affect the subnet as a whole because the majority should correctly compute the state of the subnet and thereby a malicious uh, node cannot negatively impact the subnet. This approach of using replication to gain security requires a consensus protocol. The subnet must process different messages namely messages from users to canisters and from canisters to canisters. And they must all process the same messages in the same order such that they achieve the same state. But each of the replicas that powers the subnet might actually see the messages in a different order. We use a consensus algorithm for all the nodes powering the subnet to agree on, a, on an ordering of the messages to process such that they can all process the same messages in that order. We're going to reach consensus by using a blockchain. The messages that a subnet should process are grouped together and placed in blocks, and each block points to a previous block, thereby forming a blockchain. And now, the security that we want is that all the replicas agree on the blockchain, thereby giving an ordering of the messages to execute. So more precisely, we want what we call safety. That is, if two honest replicas think they agree on the blockchain up to a certain point, then they must, in fact, have the same view of that blockchain up to that point. So they really agree on the order. Secondly, we want liveness, meaning that the blockchain keeps growing and we keep agreeing on more and more blocks, and thereby the subnet continues making progress and uh, the subnet continues processing messages. Third, we want what we call validity, meaning that all the blocks and the messages in the blocks are actually valid. And the difficulty here is that we want this to hold even if some of the nodes powering the subnet might misbehave. They might be offline or even actively malicious. And so we want that all these properties hold as long as less than a third is offline or malicious. In the examples that we're going to see in the following slides, we'll, we'll often use four nodes, meaning that at most one of them is malicious. So now we know that we want to use a blockchain for each subnet, such that the subnet can reach agreement on which messages to process. So for the remainder of the talk, we're going to zoom into one subnet and see how we actually reach consensus. We will do that by building on top of a peer-to-peer -peer gossip network that we have, so which is what the nodes will use to exchange artifacts. And we will only focus on ordering of messages. That means that some other part of our protocol is responsible for the actual processing of these messages. So let's dive into our consensus protocol. First, it's important to note that there are many consensus protocols out there. 
But we chose to design our own protocol tailored to the needs of the internet computer. We're trying to optimize for throughput, latency, and also protocol simplicity. Our protocol contains four main parts. The first is block making. This creates candidate blocks out of which we can build blockchains. The next is notarization. This is responsible for identifying valid blocks out of which we can build valid blockchains. Next, we're going to add the random beacon. The random beacon will give us some randomness that we can use to further enhance our protocol. And finally, we use finalization, which will tell us when we've actually reached agreement. We'll go through these in order. So we'll start with the block maker. A replica on the subnet can serve as the block maker. It will have some messages available that should be processed by the canisters that run on this subnet. It might have a blockchain up to a certain height, let's say 29, and now it gathers messages that it has available waiting to be processed, groups them together into a block, and proposes an extension to the blockchain by sending it on this gossip network to the other replicas. Here, it's important to remember we want this protocol to work even if some participants are actually misbehaving. This means that we cannot elect one single block maker to extend the blockchain because this, this one block maker might actually be malicious and we could be stuck forever violating our liveness goal. We'll therefore have many replicas serving as block makers in every round. Now for the same reason, these block proposals may actually be invalid. To deal with that, we have the process called notarization. And the notarization process ensures that every round we have at least some valid block that can extend the blockchain. It works as follows. Let's look at replica one. And replica one has a notarized blockchain up to height 29. If it now sees a block extending that blockchain at height 30, it will validate that block. And if replica one sees that this block is valid, it might place a cryptographic signature on it that we call the notarization share. The notarization share will be sent to the other replicas in the subnet, expressing that replica one thinks this is a good block. Now maybe replicas three and four might also create notarization shares on that same block. And now we say that three out of the four replicas is sufficient approval. We combine these three notarization shares into a single artifact, which we call the notarization. And now block 30 is notarized. The notaries will now move on to the next round and start looking for height 31 blocks. Note that here, three out of four is the highest amount of approval we can hope to get because the protocol should make progress even if one of the nodes is misbehaving or offline. For these notarization shares, we use special signatures called multi-signatures. Multi-signatures have the nice property that many signatures on the same message can be compressed into a single constant size signature that proves that all the nodes actually approved. This means that even if we have a very large subnet with many notaries, the notarization will still be a small object. Notarization will not always work as well as I just described. Sometimes we have a bit of a more difficult situation. The replica might see a valid block and create a notarization share on that block. However, it might now see another candidate block at the same height, which is also valid. If the replica would only sign one of the blocks, we might actually get stuck because some notaries might support one block while others notaries support another block and neither will ever get enough approval. Because we need this liveness property, the notary will now actually sign both of the blocks, making sure that at least one of them will become notarized. This way, we might actually obtain multiple notarized blocks at one height. So with the block maker and the notary, we now know that we can get, we can identify valid blocks, but we haven't reached agreement yet because at every height, there may be multiple notarized blocks. So what we have might look like a tree of many valid blocks. Well, we want to finally achieve agreement on a blockchain. And so now we're going to add some things to our protocol to reduce the amount of notarized blocks that we get every round. We're going to introduce the random beacon. The random beacon 
is a random value shared by the replicas of the subnet, um, which we will then use to further enhance the protocol. The replicas create that together, just like they create notarizations. A replica might have a random beacon at height 29 and might decide that it's time to create the next random beacon. To do that, it will create a special signature on the previous random beacon value. And this is another artifact that we share via the gossip network. And this artifact we call a random beacon share. If we now get another random beacon share, we can combine the shares to construct the next random beacon value. We do this by using special signatures, namely threshold BLS signature. They have the special property that they are unique, which means it doesn't matter which replicas participate to construct the value but it's also unpredictable because the replicas cannot construct that value by themselves. These threshold BLS signatures require special key material where a secret key is shared between the parties, um, which we set up via a protocol called distributed key generation. But this is something we won't go into in this talk. Now that we have this common randomness, we're going to use that to rank the block makers every round. So, for example, using the random beacon that we created in round 23, we're going to rank the block makers uh, in round 24. So perhaps at round 24, we can agree that replica one is the top priority block maker, the rank zero block maker. We still need to have fallbacks because replica one might not do its job properly. So we can say that replica four might be chosen as the rank one block maker, the first fallback. And if that doesn't work, then replica three is the rank two block maker. And finally, replica two is the last resort. And remember, this random beacon is a common random value. So all the replicas can agree on this ordering of the block makers. We're now going to use this block maker ranking to further enhance the notary behavior. More precisely, when a notary enters a round, it starts a timer. And for the first amount of time, it's only looking to create a notarization share for the block by the rank zero block maker. Only if that fails after a certain amount of time, it is willing to fall back to a block proposal from the rank one block maker. And after another timeout, it's willing to fall back even further to the rank two or rank three block maker. This should reduce the amount of notarized blocks that we get every round. Let's consider an example. Replica one is in round 30 and it receives a valid block proposal for height 30 but it's only the rank one block maker. So first it's going to wait because it's not willing to notary sign the rank one block yet. If things go well, it might now receive a block proposal from the rank zero block maker. Now the notary creates a notarization share on this block. If other notaries do the same thing, then hopefully only the rank zero block will become notarized and the rank one block will not be. So here we actually reduce the amount of blocks that become notarized in a round. This helps us come much closer to agreement already. Now we might still in some rounds have multiple notarized blocks, but hopefully in many rounds, we actually have only one notarized block from the rank zero block maker. If there is only one notarized block in a round, then we have actually already reached agreement. This is because a valid chain must exist of notarized blocks at every round. And if there is only one candidate block at a round, then every chain that moves past that point must go through that block. And therefore, the chain implied by that block must actually be agreed upon. So now the challenge is, how do we know that we've actually reached agreement? How can replicas know that they can consider the chain finalized? One option is by simply waiting for some amount of time and assuming that after some time, you must have seen all the notarized blocks that will exist. In this case, the replica might say, I think I've seen all the notarized blocks up to height 35, and therefore I can consider the chain final up to that point. Meaning that some small forks that we had actually are stale because they didn't have notarized blocks continuing that chain. However, this is also a very risky approach. It may have been the case that our network didn't function properly, and there were actually other notarized blocks that we just hadn't seen yet. Suppose there was another notarized block at height 35 and blocks building on top of that. This might mean that we have considered the incorrect chain to be agreed upon, meaning we violated our safety property that we set out to reach. 
So this puts us in a very difficult position. We want the subnet to be responsive for the user, meaning we want to reach agreement very quickly on messages. But at the same time, we know we need to wait a long time such that we realize safety. We avoid this trade-off by using a different mechanism to observe agreement. We have a separate asynchronous finalization process that helps us detect when we have reached agreement. Remember that notaries create notarization shares until they see that one block is fully notarized, at which point they move on to the next round. Now we're going to have the notaries share some information about how many blocks they notary signed, which will help us reach agreement. More precisely, if the notary did not create any notarization shares for blocks other than the first notarized block itself for the round, it will create a, a different type of signature that we call the finalization share. The finalization share essentially means that I, replica one, did not notary sign any height 30 block other than this one. This is another artifact that it will gossip to the rest of the subnet. And if sufficiently many other replicas also create finalization shares on the same block, then we can aggregate them into a single finalization. Here again, we need three out of four, or n minus f more generally. And whenever we see such a finalization on a block, we know that we can trust the blockchain up to that point, because a finalization is proof that no other notarized block at that height can exist. If the network behaves well, this means we can actually reach agreement on blocks very quickly, because we can very quickly create these finalization shares and reach agreement on the blockchain. But additionally, we are not at risk of these network attacks. So even if the network does not behave well, we know that we're still safe because we only rely on signatures and not on the assumption that we've seen all messages. So I claim that a full finalization means that there cannot exist other notarized blocks. Let's go a little bit into the theory and see why that is actually the case. We know that if a block is finalized, it means that three notaries created finalization shares on this block. Because we have four nodes, we have to tolerate that one of them is corrupt, but that still means that we know for sure that at least two replicas were honest and created a finalization share on the block. We also know that honest replicas only create such a finalization share if they did not notary sign any other block at that height. So that means that two replicas definitely did not create notarization shares for any block other than the finalized one at this height. We also know that a notarization requires three notarization shares. So three replicas must participate to reach that. But we only have four replicas on the subnet, and we said that two out of them definitely did not contribute to notarizing any other block, which leaves only two replicas. And two is not sufficient to reach this notarization threshold of three, thereby concluding the proof that a finalization means there are no other notarized blocks at that height. And this is under the assumption that less than a third of the replicas are corrupt. I showed this now for, four, for a subnet of size four with at most one corrupt replica, but you can easily extend the same argument uh, to n replicas as where f are corrupt as long as f is less than a third of n. So in summary, we have a consensus protocol that consists of four components. The block maker creates candidate blocks to extend the blockchain, we have a notarization process that ensures valid blocks are identified. We then add a random beacon that we can use to rank block makers and reduce the amount of notarized blocks we get at every round. And we use an asynchronous finalization mechanism that lets us know when a blockchain is actually agreed upon without needing to rely on networking assumptions. Together, this allows us to use replication within a subnet that gives us the security and the reliability that we want from the internet computer.